Well, good morning, everyone. I'm glad you decided to get up early and, and come listen to this talk because I think it's going to be very intriguing. Uh, Mr. Kenneth Getzendonner is here from the Goddard Space Flight Center. And uh, Kenny graduated from University of Pennsylvania. I'm sorry, Penn State University. Oh, that's a big faux pas. <laughs> <laughs> from Penn State and also the University of Maryland. And he's the flight dynamics manager for OSIRIS-REx, so he knows how to fly this thing. And actually, it turns out his research interests include precision orbit determination. And you're gonna hear a whole lot about precision this morning. We were trying to calculate earl earlier uh, what in simple terms what is the orbit velocity and we came up with it's a fraction of one mile an hour is the orbit velocity around osiris rex and i have no idea how you can actually do that so please uh, enjoy th this talk kenneth that's all yours thank you john david um so the first thing i want to do is acknowledge our partners so osiris rex uh, the pi is out of the university of arizona as long along with our science planning team uh, nasa goddard space flight center manages the mission and of course uh, lockheed martin built and is now operating the spacecraft and i want to point out particular attention to our primary navigation contractors kinetics aerospace uh, who we work very closely with um, and, and have done a phenomenal job so far uh, so, as John David said, I am the Flight Dynamics Manager. I work as part of the navigation team. Um, and because of that, uh, I'll caveat my presentation that there is tons of really exciting and fascinating scientific discoveries out of this mission. I am by far the least qualified person to talk about those. Um, but what's equally as interesting and, and I think important to highlight is some of the navigation challenges and accomplishments that we've had on this mission. So that's going to be the, the exact focus of, of my presentation today. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about OSIRIS-REx. Uh, so the main goal of OSIRIS-REx is to rendezvous with the near-Earth asteroid Bennu, uh, touch down on the surface, soft contact at about 10 centimeters per second, collect 60 grams of pristine sample, stow that away safely in our sample return capsule, bring the whole spacecraft back to Earth, and drop the sample capsule off in the Utah desert where scientists can study that 60 grams or more of sample for decades to come. What enables us to be able to do that sample collection procedure, though, um, is that we spend a lot of time characterizing both the asteroid itself and the environment that we're operating in. And that's important for a couple reasons. One, it enables us uh, to actually perform that touch and go sample collection to be able to navigate the spacecraft and predict the dynamics very accurately. Two, it allows us to pick a sample site off of the surface. Where is a safe place to land? Uh, what is, what's our highest probability of, of meeting that level one requirement of collecting that 60 grams? And three, it's important to provide scientific context. Where was that sample taken? How does it compare with other regions on Bennu, et cetera? Um, so we launched in September of 2016. We had a two-year outbound cruise. Uh, after those, uh, it, uh, about a year after launch, we had an Earth gravity assist that changed our orbit plane to match that of Bennu. Uh, we arrived in the asteroid in December of uh, 2018. Uh, we inserted into our first orbit in, in, uh, on New Year's Eve, December 31st, uh, 2018. And we've been operating the vicinity of Bennu ever since. So this was our target. Uh, this is what we thought Bennu looked like before we actually arrived. This is based on radar observations from Goldstone and Arecibo. And it was one of the most well-characterized asteroids from the ground at the time that we launched, which was really uh, useful, particularly for the navigation team, but for the whole planning team itself. We actually had fairly good estimates of its shape, as you can see. Uh, we also had pretty good estimates of its spin state and also its mass. Uh, by looking, predicting the orbit and the trajectory, uh, we were able to use that information by modeling some of the small forces, including the thermal re-radiation off the surface of Bennu. And with that, we were able to predict both its orbit and its uh, mass. And this is what we actually found when we got there. So ignore the surface for a minute. <laughs> we'll get to that because uh, that's usually the first things people recognize. But overall, the, we got the shape pretty much right from the ground. 
Uh, this top shape with the bulge at the equator. It's a little bit more squished than we thought, uh, but for the most part, the overall size and shape match what we thought. The spin state was also relatively accurate, uh, certainly good enough for initial characterization, and the mass was always uh, also very accurate, within about a sigma or so from the ground-based predictions. So one thing, uh, this is a, a fairly dated graphic, but the sizes and relative sizes are still very, uh, very much uh, applicable. You can see that Bennu is only about 500 meters in diameter. And that's important from a navigation perspective because the gravitational attraction from this body is so low. Orders of magnitude what we're typically used to in normal interplanetary navigation to typical interplanetary targets. Um, and why that's important is because these small forces that we typically either only consider or ignore, solar radiation pressure, thermal re-radiation from the spacecraft, thermal emission from the uh, body itself acting on the spacecraft, all of those are a significant fraction of the gravitational acceleration itself. So all of those forces and being able to model those forces are very, very important for us to be able to do. And that falls on the navigation team with, with help with, from our science team and, uh, science, and uh, spacecraft operations team as well. So how do we navigate? Well, I'm sure most everybody in this room are familiar with interplanetary navigation. Um, we have the spacecraft out in space, we have DSN antennas on the ground, we collect range, Doppler, and delta door measurements that provides our relative range, range rate, and angular position of the spacecraft relative to the Earth. We know the Earth really well relative to the center of the solar system. Therefore, we know where the spacecraft is really well uh, compared to both Earth and the Sun. However, what we don't know is our position, the spacecraft's position relative to the asteroid. We have we had estimates prior to arrival of the ephemeris of Bennu, um, but they weren't perfect. There were errors and certainly not accurate enough to do really close precision navigation. So we rely on relative measurements between the spacecraft and the asteroid itself. And we rely on optical navigation to do that. So images we take from the spacecraft, processing those images and using that information to figure out where we are relative to the asteroid at any particular time. We have a couple different flavors of optical navigation we use. Uh, when we're really far away from the body and it maybe only shows up as a few pixels until it almost fills the field of view but doesn't completely field of view, we can use centroid-based optical navigation, which through various techniques we can precisely find, excuse me, the center of figure of the asteroid and compare that to precise pointing we get from uh, essentially doing a star tracker solution. And that gives a very accurate bearing measurement of Bennu relative to the spacecraft. And that's the first way that we use optical navigation. Once we've had an opportunity to approach the object, fully characterize it, map it, and build up these uh, sets of DTMs using a technique we call stereophotoclinometry, we can switch over to a terrain relative technique where we switch from our landmark being the center of the object to actual surface features on the surface of Bennu itself. And those surface features are actually the DTMs that we construct from imaging data in previous phases. And that provides us you know, dozens per image of precise landmark measurements that we can use in our orbit determination solution. Speaking of imagers, we have a few imagers uh, on board the spacecraft. Uh, so Polycam is our wide field of view, or our, sorry, our narrow field of view uh, telescope, essentially. Um, Mapcam is our medium field of view instrument. We also have a SAM cam uh, that's a slightly wider field of view that's specifically used to uh, uh, image the sample collection event, which we'll talk about in a minute. And the main workhorse for navigation are our two navigation cameras, our wide field of view nav cam and our wide field of view NFT cam. Both of them have field of views that are about 30 by 40 degrees field of view, so they're pretty wide, um, but that's uh, very useful for navigation. We also, on the science side, have three uh, spectrometers, an X-ray uh, spectrometer, Rexus, a thermal emission spectrometer, OTES, and a visible infrared spectrometer, OVIRS. The last instrument, OLA, is a Canadian contributed instrument, and it's a scanning uh, 3D uh, laser altimeter. And that's actually important, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, it's, it's been a very useful instrument so far, particularly given some of the challenges that we've seen on OSIRIS-REx. So let's talk about the proximity operations to date. So we had our first light, our first image of Bennu that we got from the spacecraft on August 17th of last year. 
And that marked the start of our approach phase. That's the first time the navigation team and the spacecraft team as a whole got to operate relative to the spacecraft. From here on out, we were doing optical navigation, navigating relative to Bennu. And as we got closer, Bennu started out as just a tiny little dot, maybe a few pixels, that isn't uh, completely resolved and dominated by a point spread function. And as we got closer and closer, we started slowing our approach velocity with up to four approach maneuvers. Um, it started getting bigger and bigger and bigger in the field of view. And we had to start from an optical navigation centroiding technique of fitting point spread functions to eventually actually having to take into account that shape that we estimated from the ground and actually doing 2D cross correlation of the resolved body. As you can see, we get closer and closer, it gets larger and larger, and features start to get more and more resolved. And I think in one of these images towards the end, you can start to see a large boulder start to crop up in the image. So after this approach phase, uh, we did our preliminary survey, which is a series of five hyperbolic flybys. And that was a particularly important phase because that allowed us to really estimate the uh, gravity, the GM of Bennu. And with that gravity information, we're able to design an orbit, a two by, approximately two by one and a half, it was actually a little larger, it was 2.1 by 1.6. The design was a two by one and a half kilometer orbit in the terminator plane, so the plane that uh, is perpendicular to the sun line. And the other thing that we were able to do is design it and adjust the eccentricity such that the orbital elements are frozen. So if you entered into a, just a regular circular orbit at this point, solar radiation pressure and other perturbing forces would start to evolve the orbit in various ways. But because we chose eccentricity, we were able to balance those particular forces and set a frozen orbit. So this is the first such application. Of course, there's frozen orbits for many other bodies, but this is the first such application of a frozen orbit for a small body. Orbit A was significant for a couple other reasons as well. Uh, we broke two world records, uh, one for the smallest object ever orbited. Bennu is by far the smallest object ever orbited. Of course, missions like Hayabusa, um, at the asteroid Itakawa or at similar size objects, but they never inserted into actual captured orbit. Bennu, we actually inserted into a captured orbit. And we also got the world record for the smallest captured orbit, as I said, about 1.6 by 2.1 kilometers. And then, because this is what we like to do on this mission, we broke it again. Uh, and when we inserted into our orbit B phase, we got down into an orbit that was just over uh, 900 meters uh, in radius from the center of Bennu. So here are a few images from our transition into that orbit B phase. Uh, I will mention we had a fairly intense hyperbolic characterization uh, period between orbit A and orbit B. Uh, I kind of glossed over that since the focus of this talk is for late breaking news. Um, but here are some of the navigation images from our wide field of view camera that we took uh, during orbit B. And each image is separated about two hours uh, with eight hour gaps per day for a high gain pass where we slewed to point back to Earth. But the rest of the time we were pointed at the asteroid with the instrument deck. Oop, gotta go back. So another important aspect of Orbit B is allowed us to do our OLA global mapping campaign. So we took that 3D scanning LIDAR I mentioned before, and we got tons and tons, and when I say tons, I mean um, you know, hundreds of gigabytes of data. It was, it was pretty impressive. Um, and we're able to build global topographic maps. And we're, able to, we're starting to use those global topographic maps for navigation, both to improve our solution as well as to verify it, provide an independent verification of the optical-only derived solution. The other thing that it enabled is our highest fidelity look at each individual potential sample sites. And we're able to use that particular data to down-select from um, dozens of potential sample sites to 16 to 8 to 4, like the basketball tournament. Since I am a navigator, I wanted to just very briefly mention our navigation performance. Um, we're seeing meter level performance when we're in orbit, so tens of meters to hundreds of meters um, after you know, a week of propagation. The real key performance metric, though, is 24 hours uh, of, of navigation performance. And that's important because that's the amount of time that we have to update our spacecraft knowledge between the last time we get an image from uh, 
from the spacecraft until we have to eventually depart for tag when we perform the touch and go sample collection. So it's very important for us to get that navigation performance in orbit as best as we can. The other thing I'll mention is we have completed or successfully executed a total of 64 proximity operations maneuvers to date. And we'll do our 65th tomorrow uh, evening, uh, roughly at uh, 9 o'clock Eastern time. So what are some early discoveries and, and what are some implications with that uh, as well uh, in, in terms of navigation? Well, as you might have noticed for some of our images, Bennu is a lot more rugged, a lot more rough than we initially thought, which, as you might expect, has implications both for sample site selection and tag navigation performance. In terms of navigation performance, it really drove down our uh, navigation accuracy requirement for tag, uh, what we call bullseye tag. So originally this orange circle that you see here was our original requirement. We had to deliver the spacecraft to the surface within a 50 meter diameter circle. As you can obviously tell by this particular image, that's not gonna cut it. So some sites we can find maybe things that are around 10 meters in diameter, some of them are only five meters in diameter. So our original approach to navigation for TAG doesn't work in this scenario. Fortunately, the project invested in some onboard navigation capability that's being developed by Lockheed Martin called our natural feature tracking. And that's an onboard terrain relative optical based uh, solution that includes hazard avoidance. And we're working on that now, uh, updating our covariance analysis and refining our performance to make sure that we can collect a sample that's consistent with our navigation performance. Another unexpected discovery is Bennu is an active asteroid, which is something that not many people thought. Um, there's actually particles about centimeter scale and size that are being ejected off the surface. Um, there's a few theories about what mechanisms are, are causing that. I'm certainly not qualified to, to talk to that myself, but there are plenty of papers on it. Uh, they're being published now. Dante Loretta, the PI, is, is leading the charge on that one. But that posed an interesting challenge for the navigation team and an interesting opportunity as well. If you could track these particles, you could actually use them as navigation beacons and use them to actually characterize the gravity field to much higher fidelity than we ever thought possible. So our navigation team sprung into action, took our optical navigation tools and processes and made it so that we could automatically identify these particles from long exposure images. And with that data, along with our colleagues on the radio science team, we were able to fit orbits and trajectories to these particle events. Now you can see some of them clearly escape, go away from the asteroid, never to return again. Some of them almost immediately re-impact the surface, but some of them actually remain in orbit for long periods of time, relatively long periods of time. We're talking days, uh, not much longer. So this is a graphic that our colleagues at the radio science team at JPL put together. Uh, but you can see over a few, uh, a few days in our uh, Orbit A campaign back in January, we can start to see some particles that are relatively long lived. And we've used those particle trajectories to give us our best estimate of Bennu's gravity field to date, which is important for our tag navigation accuracy requirements. Um, so this was certainly an interesting surprise, um, but something that had presented a unique challenge and a unique opportunity as well. So what's the current status? Well, back in July, we selected our final four candidate sites based on uh, many different criteria, uh, most notably our deliverability, our ability to deliver the spacecraft safely to that particular site, um, hazards, so safety, how safe is that site, how confident are we of spacecraft safety when we touch down on the surface, and also sampleability. Is the material, do we have enough fine grain material um, that's not covered with rocks or other obstructions that we can actually collect our 60 grams if we touch down on the surface? Here's a view of our four, final four sample sites. Uh, Nightingale DL-15, Kingfisher CQ-13, Osprey DL-06, and Sandpiper EX07. Now this was based on detailed survey imagery, which was the highest resolution imagery we had at the time. That wasn't quite good enough to select a final site and also to do preparation, final preparations for, the, uh, for TAG for the ultimate uh, prime and backup candidate sites. 
So we are currently, right now, executing our Recon A phase. In fact, we're almost done with it. We'll be completed with it tomorrow. Um, Recon A phase is a series of one kilometer hyperbolic flybys. We do one over each candidate site for a total of four. Uh, as you can see, each one consists of one maneuver that sets up the flyby, and we're about to do a flyby here. Immediately after, we perform another maneuver to drift away from the asteroid, and then a third maneuver to recycle us back to the starting point. And we do that four different times for four different sites. We'll do our last site, DL-15 Nightingale, tomorrow. We're going to do the navigation late update today. We're downlinking the images, doing the orbit determination solution. We'll provide that updated uh, ephemeris information to the spacecraft team, who will build an update ephemeris, uplink it to the spacecraft tomorrow morning, and it will use that ephemeris to actually adjust the observations that we take uh, in real time to make sure that we capture the data that we want for the specific site. After that's completed, next week, we'll perform two more maneuvers to insert us back into an orbit that's sort of in between orbit A and orbit B. So another frozen orbit, not quite as close as orbit B, but a little closer than orbit A. So these are some images that just came down from the spacecraft over the last few weeks. So EX-07 Sandpiper was our first site. This image came down on October 5th. Does anybody find a good spot to land on there? That's what I thought. <laughs> uh, we also have Osprey DL06, which was taken a week later on October 12th. The Kingfisher images were just released yesterday. Uh, that flyby was done on October 19th. And as I mentioned, the final recon executes tomorrow, and those images, they usually uh, release them the following Thursday. So a little less than a week away from now, we'll have those final images of our final sample site. So what are the next steps? Well, the Recon A data is great, but it's still not quite good enough. Um, it's good enough for us to be able to select a prime and backup sample site. It's not good enough to build the topographic maps that we need to do the terrain relative navigation to the surface. So to do that, we have to do two more reconnaissance campaigns, a medium recon and a low recon. The medium recon, which will execute uh, early next year, uh, is about 600 meters uh, altitude above the specific site. And the low altitude is a little over 200 meters or so from the site. Both of them, we start and end from the same terminator orbit. So that orbit A, that safe home orbit we like to call it. Uh, we perform one maneuver. About 12 hours later, well, a few hours later, we'll perform the flyby in between those red and cyan dots you see there. And then a few more hours after that, a total from departure to recapture of 12 hours will recapture into orbit and continue on our circular orbit. And we have opportunities to trim that orbit uh, to, to take into account any maneuver execution errors we have from the recapture. Last but not least, we'll perform a couple. Once we select that prime and backup site, we have all the data that we need. We'll perform touch and go sample collection. We get two rehearsals. Uh, one of them, we performed two of the four maneuvers. The other one, we performed three of the four maneuvers. Uh, but ultimately, we'll perform a touch and go sample collection. It's a three maneuver sequence to leave orbit and get down to the surface. About halfway through our departure, we'll extend our sample collection arm. So here we're performing our checkpoint maneuver, our match point maneuver. And then at a velocity of about 10 centimeters per second, so this is much, much faster than uh, real time here, we'll touch the surface and make contact for five seconds. And this little device that looks like an old style car air filter off of like a 57 Chevy um, will insert, will release gas, uh, shoot gas underneath that filter. And it'll stir up the regolith. The gas is allowed to escape out the side of the filter. The regolith is tra trapped in the filter itself. After that five second sequence is up, we immediately depart away from Bennu. Now, at that point, when we're drifting away from Bennu, we have to verify that we have a sample. And the way that we do that is we obviously extend the arm and take some images of it, but that's not quite enough. What we do instead is we rotate the spacecraft slightly. We measure the change in inertia. And that change in inertia gives us a pretty good estimate of how much sample we've collected. The error bars are pretty large on that, so we end up having to get you know, roughly double or so of what the actual uh, sample, the 60 grams that we want to be able to confirm that we've collected a sample. Um, but it's still accurate enough for us to be able to use it. So in conclusion, um, you know, OSIRIS-REx has, has given us an up-close and uh, breathtaking view of the near-Earth asteroid Bennu. 
Um, Bennu's surface roughness has provided a challenge both to site selection and navigation, uh, leading us to baseline what we call our bullseye tag. Fortunately, the navigation performance to date has been exceptional. Um, and I'm not just saying that because I'm on the navigation team. Um, the high reconnaissance passes, which will be completed tomorrow, combined with the medium and low reconnaissance passes completed early next year, will set us up for a, a tag, uh, our first tag attempt in the middle of 2020. And with that, I will open it up to questions. Um, I will apologize ahead of time. I forgot that uh, I was supposed to mention that we are using Slido for this presentation. Um, I do see one particular question. Is there a graphic showing the size of OREX relative to Bennu? Um, so I don't have one in this particular presentation. If you go to the website, asteroidmission.org, they, they have uh, various diagrams that will show you the relative scale. Uh, OSIRIS-REx is just a little bit taller than, than me. So if you imagine that, uh, you know, those images that I showed earlier on in the presentation of Bennu compared to the Empire State Building, you know, Bennu, imagine me or a, you know, one or two of me compared to the Empire State Building, and that's the relative size. Um, so I think I have maybe a few more minutes for a few more questions. I can open it up to the floor if anybody is interested. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so that's a very interesting question. So as you might imagine, uh, when we first detected these particles, uh, so let me repeat the question. So the question was, um, with respect to the particles, uh, they don't necessarily pose a threat to the spacecraft themselves because of their size and relative velocities, but do they pose a threat to the instruments and was anything done relative to, the, uh, to protect the instruments? And as you might imagine, when we first got these images, we were very excited for the scientific discovery, but we were also really concerned. Um, so we did plenty of calculations, uh, you know, first back of the envelope and then uh, a more higher fidelity to figure out what the distribution is and probability of these particles as they come off the surface and their relative size and magnitudes and where our spacecraft was relative to its orbit. And we determined that even with these particle ejection events, the probability of us impacting through that flux or, th or getting hit with a particle was really, really low, acceptably low within mission requirements, um, below 99.9% probability of getting impact by anything significant. Um, and then we did an analysis to figure out, okay, well, that's just anything to hit the spacecraft. Um, you know, what about the instruments? And obviously that probability was even lower. And the analogy, any spacecraft that goes up, you do micrometeorite analysis to make sure that the spacecraft can survive impacts from debris out in interplanetary space. And what we found is our, our chances of getting hit by something and having it uh, have an impact on the mission in orbit due to these debris clouds were less than what we had when we were out in space and getting hit by one of these high velocity particles. So that was a good comparison that we used. Yeah, okay, uh, so this is actually a good question. I like this one. What happens if you do not get a sample on the first try? Um, so we actually have uh, multiple attempts. We baseline up to three attempts. Uh, we actually have a few more than that. It depends how much, we have plenty of fuel, um, but there's a limiting factor with some fuel get, who, that gets uh, caught in a trap because we're doing these vector burns on the surface. That's kind of the real limiting factor. The other limiting factor is uh, the nitrogen gas itself. Once we deplete that, we have no more, uh, but that allows us at least three attempts, uh, if not more. Uh, so the idea is if we drift away from the asteroid and we detect that we did not collect a sample, we'll perform a sequence to go back into orbit, assess why we didn't collect a sample, probably pick a new sample site to go to because we've already disturbed the one that we wanted. Uh, so all that process will take a little bit of time, but we do have uh, the margin, both from a propellant standpoint and other consumable standpoints, to do multiple tag attempts. It'll just take, obviously, a lot longer and that'll extend the mission and uh, eat up some uh, operations costs and margin associated with that. Uh, so, so we're very robust in that sense. Uh, another good question, what type of propulsion system is used for the relative maneuvers? Uh, so the relative maneuvers, we use all monoprop hydrazine. We actually have a few different flavors of maneuvers. We have uh, DC, or, uh, deep space maneuvers, big thrusters. 
Uh, we have TCM thrusters, which are a little bit in between. Uh, we have ACS thrusters, which are slightly smaller. We use in the tens of centimeters per second range, uh, down to a few centimeters per second. And we actually have a set of LTR thrusters that we can do very precise phasing sub-millimeter per second maneuvers. And that's required at these such low orbital velocities, excuse me, when you're trying to phase the orbit maybe a week in advance, that requires a very small change in your velocity. So we added these uh, low, uh, LTR thrusters to be able to operate. But the propulsion is all uh, uh, monoprop hydrazine. What software do you use for planning and propagating the relative trajectories? That's a good question. So all of our operational products are, uh, we use uh, Mirage, which is a derivative of the JPL Heritage operational software called ODP, or the Orbit Determination Program. Uh, but for trajectory design, we also use GMAT and SDK. Uh, most of the outbound uh, crews, uh, we use GMAT to optimize and model that particular trajectory. Most of the ProxOps design is done in SDK. And then once we have those targets, we take those targets, uh, implement them in uh, Mirage. Mirage is used to actually generate the maneuver product planning. Uh, we upload those to the spacecraft. But all the orbit determination, all the trajectory prediction is done with Mirage. And maybe I have uh, one more uh, question. Oh, so this is another good one. Can you explain the sharp angle trajectory shown in the screen? So that's one of the benefits of being able to use or to, to, to operate in such a small body environment. To be able to, since we're only going centimeters per second, to completely reverse your trajectory or reverse your orbit, it only takes you know, a few centimeters per second to do that, tens of centimeters per second to do that. And we have plenty of opportunity and plenty of fuel to do that. So we don't really have to, we're not bound by orbital mechanics in that sense. We don't, we're not limited to optimal transfers. We can do whatever makes sense operationally and we can sort of zigzag our way around the asteroid uh, as much as we want. So with that, I think I'm out of time for questions. Uh, thank you very much, it's, it's been a pleasure. Hello everyone, I would like to welcome you all to this session about the UAE Astronaut Program. So to start with, my name is Saad Karmustaji, Director of Communication at the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center. And here we have my colleague, uh, Mariam Zarouni, Head of the Studies Unit at the Space Center. Adnan Raiz. Hi, um, I'm Adnan Raiz. the uh, Director of the Remote Sensing Department, Mohammed Barash Space Center, and also Head of the Operation at the UAE Astronaut Program. Hello, good morning. I'm Salim Al-Marri, Assistant DG at the Mohammed Barash Space Center. So the Mohammed Barash Space Center is the, is the home to the UAE National Space Program. So we have four main pillars under the Space Center. The first one is the Satellite Development Program, 
where we have launched DubaiSat 1, DubaiSat 2, uh, Khalifa Sat, which was the first ever Arab satellite built uh, in the Arab region. And it was launched to space on October 29, 2018. In, in addition to that, we have the Emirates Mars mission, which is Hope Probe. And it is the first ever spacecraft to go to any outer planet mission, the first ever Arab spacecraft, basically. In addition, we have the UAE astronaut program, where we have sent the first Arab astronaut, or first Emirati astronaut, to the International Space Station. And in the end, we have the Mars 2117 program, which is a 100-year plan to build a city on Mars. So to start this session, I would like to ask uh, Salem and Murray, basically, the, why the UAE astronaut program? Yes, thank you. So uh, I think that's a good question. When we look at uh, human space flight, uh, obviously today uh, you know, it's a, a very important factor of space exploration. And uh, we have many advanced nations that are uh, exploring space, uh, sending astronauts, and looking beyond ISS today as well, as we've heard throughout the conference, Artemis and, and the rest. And uh, for the Arab region, uh, we had uh, two astronauts who were sent in the, in the 1980s, uh, and the last mission that was sent from our region was over 32 years ago. Uh, that's too long, and uh, uh, the vision from our country is that definitely, you know, uh, the Arab region is a very large region. It, it encompasses a large population and a very young population. So about 50% of the population in the Arab world is under 30. So most of the people in our region have never been, haven't been alive the last time an astronaut was launched. So it's time to change that, but it's time to do it a little bit different. Uh, it's time to make sure that the missions are scientifically significant and that our program will be sustainable. So we will have continuous missions. And throughout our program, we intend to also inspire the regional and Arab countries to participate with us in missions and joint programs, not necessarily with astronauts at the beginning, but at least through the science, education, and outreach. And uh, this is the, uh, the overall objectives of why we are planning to go and send uh, our astronauts. We've successfully now selected two and sent uh, the first, and we look forward to future missions. Thank you, Salem. So the first Emirati astronaut was launched to space on September 25 on an eight days scientific mission. Maryam, could you tell us more about what did this mission entail? Um, okay, good morning. Uh, so his, mis Sorry. <clears throat> his mission entailed mostly of three main pillars. The first one was the scientific experiments that he would undergo. We had 16 experiments, six of them they were, that were done while he spent his time on the ISS. Um, ten of them were done before and after to see if there were any changes during his short duration flight. We also focused on an, initi an initiative called Science and Space which was done in coordination with NanoRacks. We chose 16 experiments that relate to the curriculum in schools for various age groups, in which the schools could then use it as a teaching material, as an investigative material in the future. The last uh, focus that we had was the educational aspect, which was the education videos about the ISS, how to live and how do they live in the ISS. And for the first time, these were all done in Arabic. Uh, so anyone in the Arab region, anyone who can speak Arabic, can then use those videos uh, for their uh, benefit. Um, one point to notice, also for the scientific experiments, it was the first time also done on someone from the Arab region. So I think it's an important data step, and hopefully we'll have more data points to add. I hope so too. So Salam, what kind of collaborations were made to make this mission success? Yes, I think... Uh uh, looking at, uh, obviously, our, our main partners for this mission uh, were Roscosmos, and uh, that's where we uh, worked with them to uh, secure a seat uh, and, obviously, our stay in the ISS. What we've done differently than previous uh, missions is that we have extensively collaborated with the ISS partners. So we have uh, worked jointly with uh, NASA. We've signed collaboration agreements with NASA, with the European Space Agency, uh, with JAXA and Roscosmos to have access to all segments of the ISS to conduct scientific and educational activities in the USOS, in uh, the JAXA Kibo Lab, and also in the Columbus module. So 
Uh, this was a, a unique experience for us. I would say about 40% of our activities were conducted in the Russian segment, and 60% of our activities were conducted in the USOS. And this is really, I think, a model going forward that uh, today for short duration missions, for new participants uh, in uh, human space flight, uh, this is a true model that you can cooperate with all of the partners. You can secure your ride up through the Russians, you can do it through commercial crew in the future, but you can also do separate agreements that allow you to do significant science, education, collaboration all over the station. So that's the way we set up this collaboration and we're very happy with the results. Thank you, Saddam. We all know when astronaut goes to space, there's hundreds of people work behind the scenes. And there had teams at the Space Center working from different aspects and team that had a major role in the mission success of our first UAE mission was the ground station team. Adnan, can you tell us more about it? Yeah, sure, sir. Uh, as mentioned earlier by Salem, that uh, with our astronaut program, uh, we work with, an, with all ISS partners. In fact, the international cooperation and collaboration is an integral part of all of our programs and projects. So working with, uh, within the US OS segment or the Kibo module with JAXA or the uh, Russian segment or Columbus module, uh, we had to have the, the team, the centralized team, that could support all those activities uh, happening in all those different modules, and also coordinate uh, those activities between uh, the U.S. part, uh, between uh, the ISS uh, partners. So as a result, a team uh, at the Mohammed Barsha Space Center was formed to uh, support the operation and manage all aspects of the operation of the UAE astronaut program. This team has uh, a great experience, uh, more than 10 years on operating satellites. Uh, managing all of our Earth observation missions from Dubai Sat 1 to Khalifa Sat and future missions. That's the EMM, our MS Mars mission, which will really launch uh, next year. So we have this vast experience on handling um, satellites. But this is actually our first manned mission. So different concept of operation, uh, different ways on handling issues, problems. Um, also, different ways of uh, managing the project in terms of the scheduling, planning, uh, keeping tracks of the activities, getting the data sets uh, and the videos and uh, all the data generated on board the ISS. So the team was formed, trained, in order to be able to support those activities. Uh, through our c collaboration with the European Space Agency and the ESA Astronaut uh, Center in Cologne, uh, we sent a group of our uh, engineers uh, to EAC to get the training, uh, more than four weeks uh, of dedicated training on how to handle the ISS operation, how to handle the scheduling activities, uh, how to uh, resolve conflicts uh, between the uh, different schedules and, uh, and all of that. So we had uh, more than four, four weeks of training. Uh, we had an on-job training uh, where we participated as well in uh, managing uh, a real-time operation of an existing uh, ISS operation. So this team was trained uh, and ready uh, for the launch of the first UAE astronaut on the 25th of September. During the operation, the team, uh, we had actually four different four teams. The main one was at the UAE Operation Support Center and Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center in Dubai. The second team was at the MC Mission Control Center in Moscow. The third one was at the Mission Control Center in Houston. And we had the fourth one at, uh, uh, at the Operation Center in JAXA. So uh, those four teams uh, worked uh, together to coordinate all the activities, all the operations throughout those eight days of uh, operation. And we saw that this is a very uh, a successful model on handling uh, such uh, operations and, and, and short days uh, mission. During a, th a short day's mission, you have a lot of things to do. Um, you have a lot of um, data that you need to generate and download, and also need to keep track uh, on doing that. So we, we found that that is very useful of having those teams uh, working together at those four different centers to coordinate all those activities at the end of the day to have a successful mission and achieve all the scientific uh, activities as well as the other activities that we had in terms of the um, live sessions with our astronauts. So during those uh, eight days, we had more than eight live sessions. All those sessions uh, were managed uh, by our operation uh, team and Dubai in coordination with uh, our partners uh, at the different centers. Thank you, Adnan. I would like to remind everyone that we're using slido.com. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask us through this application. 
So the, I would like to mention something. So the UAE astronaut program was announced in April 2017. And on December 6 of the same year, the vice president of the United Arab Emirates called, called the people to apply to this program through a tweet. It was a very simple tweet, a tweet that mentioned that he invites the people of the UAE, the best of the best at whatever field they're on, to apply to this program. And he provided them with the link. We expected a high number of applicants to the program, but the number really exceeded our expectation. We had over 4,000 applicants to this program. A uh, big percentage of them were female, 36% were females, and the rest were males, and the age varied from 17 years old to 67. And to us, this was uh, very shocking, to be honest, the, the age range. I remember when the tweet uh, went live, Maybe a few minutes later, we had kids stopping at the Space Center, people who were 13 and 14 coming to even myself and telling me that I, they want to apply to the astronaut program. I'm like, what do you want to do? They were like, we want to apply to the astronaut program. I'm like, do you mean internship? They're like, no, astronaut program. So it was very nice that people were excited from various ages. Uh, but at the same time, another big factor is people were not aware what does it take to be an astronaut. As uh, Salomon Murray mentioned, there's over 32 years we didn't have an astronaut uh, in the region. So for us, or for the UAE, and even for the region, this was a, a great jump uh, in terms of awareness, in terms of inspiration. So we received a big number of applicants, 4,022 applicants. Uh, Salem, uh, can you tell us why Hazza al-Mansouri and Sultan al-Niyadi as the first UAE astronaut corps? Yes, I mean, as you mentioned, we had uh, 4,000 people who had applied, and it took us about uh, 10 months to uh, uh, basically uh, evaluate all of the uh, candidates and uh, eliminate, for <coughs> I don't have a better word than that, eliminate the ones that are not suitable. And we worked uh, also closely again on this process, learning from uh, our colleagues in ESA, NASA, and Roscosmos, and uh, we also work very closely with the uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the head of the uh, U.S. astronaut corps who was on our uh, final interview panel. And the process that we went through uh, evaluated them similar to the same process that the uh, Europeans and Americans and Russians do. Uh, and that basically brought us to our top 10 uh, about 10 months later. And then we put them through uh, um, rigorous medical testing uh, for about three weeks uh, in Moscow, in Russia. And uh, from there we had uh, uh, to select from those top 10, top 9 people. And the reason we selected uh, Hazza al-Mansouri and Sultan Niyadi is, for us it was quite simple. The, first of all, the experience that both of them had. So they're very, uh, you know, uh, Hazza al-Mansouri is, is a military fighter pilot, F-16s, and he's also uh, uh, used to flying in air shows and acrobatic displays. So his experience, his thinking on his feet, uh, his uh, reaction time, his dedication to, the, uh, to his craft uh, really st stood out when, uh, when we selected him. And Sultan Niyadi is also uh, uh, is a different field, so he's uh, an engineering background, he's got a PhD in uh, communications technology and a lot of experience in developing uh, communication uh, technologies. And uh, the reason we looked at him uh, closely as well was that uh, his work experience and his uh, uh, what I would say, uh, his different appeal compared to Hazza. So Hazza is, uh, uh, as I said, a pilot, whereas Sultan has that engineering and scientific background. So it really complemented each other that for the future missions that we have, we'd like to have people from different backgrounds. After this first mission now, uh, with the excitement that we've seen in the country, the, the whole country in the region was... Uh, uh, I'd say w went wild, went mad. Uh, it's something that we were also... Uh, not expecting. Uh, the whole country is looking at space, is looking at astronauts, so we're now considering open up, uh, opening up the uh, selection process again and selecting one or two more, adding them to the UAE's uh, first selection group and putting our second selection group so that we'll have a, an astronaut core of about four, uh, four candidates. And we expect, again, more diversity there. So we've got a pilot, we've got an engineer, so now we're looking at uh, people with different skill sets and again, we always focus on selecting the best of the best. And from the people that applied, I'm pretty sure that we've selected the two of the best. Thank you, Salem.
Mariam Zarouni as head of studies unit, at the same time, she, she has a big lead on the education aspect at the Space Center. Uh, can you tell us what shift did you see after the astronaut program, uh, let's say, in the country with the youth? Um, so initially, we were doing the education for the Emirates Mars mission. And um, there were not a lot of students, there was not a lot of general public who were aware of um, the science or they didn't know that they had a future in science, I would say. With the astronaut program, we've noticed a huge jump, a huge push. How can I be an astronaut? What, what do I need to do? So we're trying to focus more on motivating them, having them to see that it's no longer a dream. You can be an astronaut, you can work to it. Um, like Salem said, you can be from different backgrounds, um, different educational backgrounds, different uh, careers, and you can end up being an astronaut if you really are dedicated and put your mind to it. Um, also, we saw different age groups. We saw kids two years old wearing the astronaut, you know, the, the blue suit that every, the astronauts wear. We had their parents, their grandparents watching at home, staying up till, I think docking was about 3 a.m. in Dubai, and everyone was glued to the TV and tweeting, uh, sending pictures, participating with us in the Space Center. We had a tent where we were doing the live sessions, and they were asking questions and trying the astronaut food. So I think the impact was great. And now we keep getting emails like, can Hazza visit us? Can, can we come and see Hazza? Can we come and see the Space Center? How can we be a part of your missions? How can we... Um, participate with you, be part of your team. So I think we've had a really, really good impact um, on, the, on the general public. Thank you, Mariam. Uh, I see that we have received lots of questions through slido.com. So first, I would like to thank you to the ones who submitted these questions. So to answer the first uh, question, so there's a question that mentioned how does your culture support small business concepts growing in sustainability on an emerging space nation? I think the best person to direct this question to is Adnan. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Saud. Yeah. Um, so as part of our Mars 2017 strategy, um, in fact, our Mars 2017 strategy, we have uh, four pillars. And one of them is the enablement, uh, to en uh, enablement of the uh, local industry. Uh, in order to uh, contribute in the development of future uh, programs and uh, projects. Uh, in order to do that, you have to have all the elements that are needed to do that. In general, Dubai and the UAE is a hub for business, tourism, and all of that. And those elements exist when it comes to the um, small to medium businesses supports uh, and services in terms of the acceleration program, innovation hubs, incubation centers, uh, VC funds. Those all exist and uh, they are mature. Uh, and we have those elements supporting other types of businesses and industries, not the space. So when we uh, put the pillars of the Mars 2117, we looked into this pillar of the enablement uh, and establishing that ecosystem and industry. And we saw those elements uh, exist. So what we did is that uh, we are using those existing elements, existing services uh, available uh, in the country. So we've partnered with our uh, local government entity and semi-government entities that they have those different programs, and we are adding that space elements to it. So in terms of innovation hub, in terms of the acceleration programs, in terms of the VC funds and other uh, activities. And uh, through our experience and backgrounds, what we are bringing here to the table are those projects. So we have different projects from Earth observation satellites to deep space missions, astronaut programs, and all of that. And those projects, we have many opportunities of development, whether the space segment or the ground segment, in terms of the applications development and, and all of that. So we have those projects, we have those ideas. We are bringing this, uh, those ideas and projects to the, uh, those uh, different initiatives and working with them on attracting uh, entrepreneurs and startups and even uh, well, uh, existing businesses as well uh, to country, so that uh, we work together on developing uh, proof of concepts that eventually could be used uh, in our uh, projects. We also have our own uh, research labs that we also establish within our universities. So it's not only about industry, but also we wanted to uh, have the contribution from our universities 
and the development for our space missions. So what we did is that uh, within the Mohammed Barash Space Center, we established two centers, two R&D centers in two different universities uh, in the country. And those two centers, in fact, developing some of the components, some of the tools that we are using in our uh, existing missions. And this was an, a great achievement, and we want to uh, apply this model on other parts of the country. Thank you, Adnan. Uh, another question from the audience. When will be the next flight opportunity for the UAE astronaut? Saddam. Uh, yes, um, this is a great question. Uh, I, one of our strategic objectives in this program, the first strategic objective was that we launch the first astronaut. The second strategic objective was that we have a sustainable program and continue launching. Uh, now that we've uh, finished the first uh, objective, uh, as I said earlier, we are looking at uh, selecting one or two more, having a larger astronaut base to select from, from future flights. And now our focus is turned towards uh, complete training. So astronaut candidate training and then uh, EVA uh, preparation and training. And then we, from there, we will be looking at uh, specific flights that would be uh, in line with our scientific and strategic objectives. Uh, obviously, uh, once we have an, an astronaut core that is trained and ready to go, that will definitely open up uh, more flight opportunities for us. So our target is in the, uh, is in, in the next uh, three to five years, we, we, we start with our next flight. Thank you, Saddam. So another question uh, from the audience. Is there a plan for a joint astronaut program similar to ESA in the region you are from, GCC? Yes, currently uh, there isn't a plan for this. So the UAE is working obviously on uh, our astronaut program, but what I can say maybe uh, I think that it will definitely go towards that. So what the UAE Space Agency uh, uh, back home has done is that they have uh, done the Arab uh, Space Coordination Group. And this Arab uh, Space Coordination Group has brought 11 Arab countries together. They meet on a regular basis and they have a catalyst project that is funded by the UAE that will be, that there's basically an environmental satellite that will be built in the UAE jointly between these 11 countries and then that will be launched and it's uh, something that all of these countries will benefit from. So definitely I would see that once we have this as a successful model where that catalyst project has succeeded, I believe these countries will probably form something more um, formal than a, a consulting group and if the, you know that could be something potentially as an organization or as an agency and then we can start looking at probably much bigger projects such as human space flight obviously doing things collaboratively doing things together uh, doing especially the science and education jointly for a, a large region is much better than doing it uh, trying to do things on your own so we are definitely reaching out to countries of the region. And I think what, what I've personally seen as a result from Hazza al Mansouri's journey is that we have got messages from all over the Arab region and Arabs all over the globe. And not only Arabs as well, I think it's uh, even in the IAC here, we've seen it as a, an international push that the international community is very happy that, first of all, a new space country has entered uh, space exploration, but also that we're doing that collaboratively. So. Collaboration is part of our DNA, and we will definitely push that out going forward. But to answer the question directly, has something happened now? No, but we are definitely going towards that. Um, and that's, again, uh, maybe our third strategic objective, that we collaborate internationally, regionally, and, and uh, in the Arab world to make sure that we are able to work together and do that. Thank you, Saddam. Another question from the audience. With Al Mansouri on his first mission, what are we hoping to accomplish with his ISS stay? Um, so I did mention that in the beginning that we, our primary focus was our science mission. We wanted to push for the science community in the UAE, in the, in the region, that you can be a part of something bigger, you can, um, blow up your research, I would say, in, in, on, a, on a different magnitude. Um, the science in the ISS is very important to us. It's very important to humanity. We've come up with a lot of new research, with a lot of new equipment and materials that we use in our everyday lives. 
in the future, we do want to have uh, scientific um, experiments stemming from our region, stemming from our universities, our schools, our industry. We do want to have uh, people from our region being the primary investigators. Um, we have long-term experiments, unique experiments to the region, unique experiments to um, the UAE, for example, the, the culture, the community, the temperature, the climate, so on. So I think the main push for us is um, the science is attainable. We want to get the science up to that standard, and we are giving them a goal to focus on. And I think Adnan can talk more about that. Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, all of our programs uh, that we have, the National Space Program, they are linked together and uh, well connected. Uh, when it comes to the UAE astronaut program, yes, we are sending our astronauts to the International Space Station, but also this is supports our long journey uh, to Mars. Uh, we're talking about the Mars 2117 strategy, 100 year strategy to send humans to Mars and build the settlement on Mars. And in order to do that, we need to have an, an active astronaut program, uh, well trained, uh, ready, uh, for future missions uh, to international space stations and supporting also the global exploration roadmap. This is something that we are looking into it and looking into the, all the gaps that uh, are, are there in the global exploration roadmap and focusing on certain gaps and on certain areas of interest so that we can contribute as well on the humanity's effort to reach Mars uh, in, in the coming uh, years. Um, as mentioned earlier, uh, science is, uh, is very important for us. When we started back in 2006 within the Mohammed Rash Space Center, and we used to be known as uh, ES, our focus was on the engineering part. So we developed our capabilities and skills in terms of developing satellite systems and space uh, elements. So we developed the Dubai Sat 1 and 2 and uh, Khalifa Sat. Science is, is important, is equally important. Uh, and therefore, we have the Emirates Mars mission, the astronaut program, where we want to promote uh, the science uh, within uh, our community. Uh, and this is a very important part as well of the uh, Mars 2117 as well. So for the astronaut program, yes, for the next mission, we want to develop science and experiments from our local universities and research institutions and see those experiments at the International Space Station implemented there and conducted there. Also within Mars 2117, we want to see that as well, focusing on certain areas related to food, water, and energy security, and how we can contribute in those areas. Thank you, Adnan. Thank you, Mariam. Salem, a quick question. What is next? Yes, so uh, 2020 is going to be a very big year for uh, the United Arab Emirates and for the Mohammed Barash Space Center. Uh, we will be launching the, uh, the Emirates Mars mission in July uh, from Japan. Uh, that the, uh, the, the, the satellite itself uh, will be integrated and go through the final, integration, uh, the final functional testing in January or February of this year in our clean rooms in Dubai. And then uh, after that final testing, we'll be sending it to Japan. So that's a very large uh, project for us. And of course, uh, that's the first uh, satellite or object from the Arab world that will be leaving Earth's orbit. Uh, we're also hosting uh, IAC in 2020. Uh, which is uh, something you'll hear a little bit more about later on. And um, obviously that IAC links up with the Dubai hosting Expo 2020. The, the, end, the, the IAC is obviously ending very close to the start of Expo. So I think there's a lot in store for 2020 for the UAE. Thank you, Salem. Uh, is it possible to play the video? We have, I think, one video with the technical team. بعطيكم تور في محطة الفضاء الدولية أكثر التجارة في العلمية ما في هذا المكان هذا الجهاز ساكت طبعا هني رواد الفضاء يلبسون بديت من أمس مهمات العلمية التجارب العلمية اللي علي 
والحمد لله بشرك كل شيء حسب المخطط غزاع المنصوري ذا اماراتي اسرونت توكينج تو يو فروم ذا انترناشونال سبيس ستيشن اي ام براود تو اناونس ذات ان 2020 ان ذا يو اي اند سبيسيفيكلي ان دبي ويل بي هوستينج ذا انترناشونال استرونيكال كونغرس اول ذا هاي ليفل اكسبيرتس ويل بي جوينينج ذيس ايفنت سو اي انفايت ايفري ون تو ان اكتوبر 2020 ان ذا يو اي Thank you everyone for attending the session and we would look, would look forward to see you all in Dubai next year. Thank you.